This conference will now be recorded. Okay, so let's get started. And uh, today's and learn, emphasis on the lunch and on the learn, right, is about kosher, kosher eating, and why this is such a uh, such an important and integral part of of Judaism and 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 Jewish life. And we're going through why kosher, starting as kosher, and also keeping it kosher. Because we don't we don't follow through, then uh, it's no longer it's no longer what it needs to be. Okay, so let's begin with some sources, and then we will uh, discuss and analyze them. Let me get to this. One second. There we go. Good. Okay, we're told in Shemot, Exodus, source number one, right? The Kodesh Tihiyun Li. It's translated, holy people you should be to me. But how do we actually define Kedusha? Well, sometimes separating. Separating, good. Okay. Ubasar Basada Trefa. Meat, flesh. Killed. That of an animal that has been torn, lo tochelu, that you shall not eat, la kelev tashlichun oto. La kelev to a dog, it should be, have a source here? Good. La kelev tashlichun oto. How are you doing? Good to see you. Good. La kelev tashlichun oto, it should be thrown to the dogs. That's interesting, right? Actually, um, by telling us to throw it to the dogs, it's letting us know that you're allowed to get benefit from it. Okay? Now, interesting. Why specifically throw it to the dogs? Okay? Now, like in our society, well, what pets do we have? Right? You know, usually the, our pets are dogs. But in the biblical time, that was not the case. So if you want to um, emphasize you can get benefit, right? So we could have said you can give it anywhere. Why mention specifically to the dogs, right? So that is actually to teach us a side concept of appreciation. We have to appreciate the dogs. Why? What dogs are we appreciating? So if you remember by the Pesach Seder, we're told that during the time of Makat Bechorot, Lo Yecha, the time of the plague of the firstborn, Lo Yecha Ratz Kelev Lishono, not even a dog barked. There was this absolute serenity. So we show our appreciation to the dogs that when the Torah wants to tell us you can get benefit, give it to the dogs. But most importantly, this will make us into a holy people. What does that mean? Let's see source number two. Rashi there says, Imatem Kedoshim Prushim, if you will be holy and separate yourselves, me shikutsei from the uh, disgusting trefo, carcasses, torn animals, right, roadkill, hareyatem shali, then you are mine. Vim lav, otherwise, einchem shali, you are not for me. Why? Why is this important? So, well, let's go further and then we'll discuss. Number three, we'll go right to the English, a lot to cover today. According to the simple meaning, the reason that is forbidden to eat impure animals is that they cause decay and illness to the soul. They prevent a person from reaching his perfection, coming close to God. Let's see four and five that we'll discuss. The reason for the laws of Kashrut is not for physical health benefits, right? Many people who are not eating kosher, right, uh, are pretty healthy uh, specimens, right? You look at the NF, maybe at the NFL, that's not so, but the NBA maybe more, right? I, I think LeBron James is a pretty uh, healthy looking fellow. Right? We wouldn't say that, that his non-kosher adherence has affected his, his physicality. However, we see that non-Jews eat non-kosher foods and are healthy. Rather, their purpose is for the well-being of the soul. Non-kosher foods remove the spirit of purity and holiness and create a blockage in the intelligence and cause cruelty. Okay? So that, I don't know if we necessarily see, right? But the idea is that for a Jewish person, 
So we have a unique soul. And that has certain sensitivities. Why is it sensitive to this but not to that? Couldn't tell you. I'm not a uh, I'm not a soul specialist. But the Torah is telling us, and it goes further, and we'll discuss this, let's, let's see five and six. It was taught by the school of Rabbi Ishmael, sin blocks up a person's heart. As it states, do not contaminate yourself through eating them, from a shratzin, uh, insects, lest you become contaminated through them. You see the Hebrew, beloti tamu bahem vinitamtem bam. And it doesn't say you will become impurified, but rather v'nitamtem, you become clogged up. What is very unique about the mitzvah of kashrut is that you literally wear this mitzvah. You literally become this mitzvah. Meaning, if I break Shabbat, so I haven't become a physical manifestation of breaking Shabbat. That's something that I did. But we literally are what we eat. Every cell of our body is there, has been constructed from the things that we eat. We literally are a walking embodiment of that which we have been eating. That's the only way that the cells have the ability to regenerate, right, to split, etc., etc. So I can understand then that kashrut all of a sudden goes into a whole different realm because it becomes me. And that's why it's the only mitzvah that we say that non-adherence will cause you to get, so to speak, a somewhat clogged up, blocked up. Why? Why would that be the case? What do you say? How would we put those two together? Why would the mitzvah of kashrut in particular cause me to get um, a spiritual cloggage, blockage? I was just going to ask, does that mean spiritually or physically blocked? <laughs> Okay, we're not talking about atherosclerosis, you know, we're not talking about that, right? We're talking about a spiritual blockage. So how are we moved spiritually? What happens? We hear something. We see something. We read something. Everything is coming through our physical senses. Our ears, or not the ears actually, but the eardrum sense, right? right? Our eyes perceive it. We have a thought. All of a sudden, something strikes us. Wow, that's interesting. Wow, that's, that's another way of looking at it. It all is working on a physical basis. So if the physicality has been spiritually compromised, there's going to be this clogging up, this blockage, right? If I am a walking, talking cheeseburger, right? So my ears are constructed from that which was extracted, my body miraculously, incredibly, extracted all that which my body could use from that which I eat. And that becomes me. Therefore, we have this unique aspect, component, when it comes to kashrut, that A, it becomes me, and therefore B, it will cause this, this blockage. Let's take a look at number six, Rabbeinu Bachia. Connection to God is impacted. You will become blocked up with them. For the word timtum blocked up. From the word timtum. Vinitamtem. The heart becomes blocked when eating non-kosher foods and a person cannot receive divine inspiration. It is possible. Now, those who are fluent with their Hebrew, 
the difference between vinitmetem, which means you become impure, and vinitamtem, you become clogged up, is the aleph, the letter aleph. It is possible that the reason the letter aleph is missing from the Hebrew word timtum is because it alludes to the prime unity. What do we what do, what do we mean by the prime unity? God, Hashem, right? God is the one, right? The only one. Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. So what happens? That unity, that godliness in a person will depart. God departs from this person. Similarly, the word chet, sin, is sometimes written without an aleph to show that one is removing this oneness, this oneness, all right? And it's interesting. Over here, we're emphasizing this oneness of God because our understanding of God is that he is all-encompassing and that, you know, our godliness, our Judaism is not something that, well, yeah, let me schedule that for Tuesday at 3 p.m but rather it is this unity, it is this, this constancy, right? But that's not meant to be onerous, that's not meant to be this heavy burden, that's meant to be very, very uplifting because it gives us opportunities every moment to become something more than just, than just ourselves with everything that we're doing. So perhaps, you know, Kashrut, we'll, we'll come to it a little, a little bit later, but the very first sin in the Garden of Eden was, was through eating, right? So every time, and what was the root? What was the root of that, right? If I could eat from every, from every tree in the Garden, but one. Why do I want to eat from that? And that's human nature, we know. But why is that human nature? What's at the root of that? Don't be so bashful. Come on, guys. What's at the root of that? Curiosity, okay. But I don't know if curiosity is enough, Jeremy, because if I'm curious and there's a serious repercussion, maybe I'll let someone else uh, explore their curiosity, right? And no, there wasn't anyone else at the time. Right. right, be fair, right? But I don't know, curiosity. Rebellion. Rebellion, Rebellion okay. Um, thinking that you know more than you Okay, I don't, yes, Cheryl? Um, wanting something you can't have, with greed. Good, or, why, or, why? But, but why do I want to have? Or, There's a beautiful passive verse in Mishle, in Proverbs. Mayim genuvim yuntuku. Stolen water tastes sweet. Stolen water tastes sweet, meaning that which I can have invariably becomes that which I want to have. Right? But if I could just build on the rebellion idea, I think it's that I don't like to be told what I can and can't do. I want to be in control. I'm the boss over here. I'm the boss over here, right? I don't like having guidelines. I don't like having parameters. I don't like having limits. I just want to do as I do. Now, What's my elevator pitch for a mitzvah? What's my elevator pitch for a mitzvah? Connection with God. Yeah. My elevator pitch is by a physical person. Okay. That allows me, right? Physical person, physical world, physical act, and allows me to touch something that is beyond that. Right? So with the kashrut, every time I walk into a store and I do 
the very mundane thing of, hmm, does this have a cert coach certification? Does it have coach certification or not? Well, let me look up on my CRC app or my Kosher Quest app, right? Either one is good. Esther, you emailed me, right? Yeah. And they have a nice list. Hmm? You, we, we discussed this, CRC I, I, or Kosher Quest, right? Kosher Quest has, has a few more that CRC doesn't have. It's more, more localized, right? So what am I doing? I am acknowledging that I'm not in charge here, that this is not my world. I'm in God's world. I'm in God's world, right? You come to my house, you're more than welcome to come to my house, you sit at the table, right? You, you, you wander into one of the bedrooms and start opening up a drawer? Hmm. That's not, uh, why? Because it's, it's my house, right? So going back to the Garden of Eden, right? So God, if he didn't want them to eat from the tree, why did he put it there? Because they need to know it's not their house. They need to know that they are in God's world. So Kashrut is a way of revisiting that fateful decision and recognizing I'm in God's world. It's not just me, whatever I want to do. And that's a way that in a very mundane act of going shopping, one is doing a physical act for the physical body in the physical world and is touching the beyond. Because I'm recognizing with every time, with everything that I do there, I'm recognizing I'm in God's world. This is not my own world. I'm a guest here in God's world and there are certain places that I go and certain drawers that I'm not meant to open up. That Aleph is this all-encompassing unity, and that's excluding that all-encompassing unity from the things that I want to do without being limited. The Ramchal of Moshe Chaim Lutzato, he writes, number seven, the prohibitions concerning forbidden foods also involve many details, as it is as is reflected in all of the commonly known laws that are treated in the halakhic writings. One who is lenient in relation to these laws when he has been instructed to be stringent is destroying his soul. How do you use that term? Yeah, mashkit nafsho. For sin dulls a man's heart in the respect that it causes true knowledge, spirit of wisdom that the Holy One, blessed be he, gives the righteous to depart from him. And he remains beastly, earthly, immersed in the gross materialism of this world. Forbidden foods are worse than all other prohibitions in this respect, for they enter into a person's body and become basar nibisaro, the flesh of his flesh. You know, we are sensitive to this because we believe, but um, I, I, I find it hard maybe for, for people who don't believe to ever consider that what they're eating is doing damage to, to, uh... It's interesting, Steve. You know, we become so sensitized, the world, to we are what you eat, mm -hmm. right? I mean, we become so sensitized towards eating healthy, eating carefully. You know, I, I think it's a, a Seinfeld, right? He's in a grocery store. Hey, you look pretty good. Right? Carbs, proteins. What, what what are you eating? You know, our whole society is so is so attuned to how our food affects us, health, mood, memory. I mean, all these things, right? So perhaps you know this. To me, it makes the next step a little bit easier. Right? That, okay, in a spiritual sense, if I, if I don't, if I'm not believing in God, I'm just a physical body, I'm just going to be here, I'm going to live out my life, and then I'm going to die, and just like the squirrel and just like anything else, right? So then you're right. But if a person, and I think we all recognize that we are a spiritual being, there's more to us 
than than just that. You know, the story I like to tell: these two guys made up that that whoever dies first will let the other one know, you know, what it's like in the afterlife. And one guy dies first, comes to the other in a dream, says, "Tell me what's it like." He goes, "It's amazing. I get up when I want to get up. I sleep when I want to sleep. I eat when I want to eat. It's amazing." So the guy says, "That's the afterlife." And he says, no, I came back as a cow in Omaha, right? Right? Like, I think, I think we all realize that there is this spiritual component to ourselves. We're not just, you know, eaters, sleepers, poopers. That, that, that's not just what we are. There's more to us than that. So once we recognize that, yeah, right? I am a spiritual being, and we recognize that it is this that's keeping me alive, this food is keeping me alive, then I don't think it's such a big step. Look, maybe I'm wrong because I, I, I firmly believe what I believe, right? But I don't imagine it's such a tremendous step to say that the food that we eat will also affect us in a spiritual sense, being that we are a composite of a physical, of physical and spiritual beings. So forbidden food, he says, is as poison or as food with which some poisons become mixed. Would anyone allow himself to partake of such food? If there were any room for suspicion, the slightest doubt, one would certainly not permit oneself to eat of it. And if one did, one would be regarded as foolish. It is poison to the heart and soul. Which intelligent person would allow himself to eat food about which has any question whatsoever, which has any question whatsoever about its permissibility, right? You know, there's only like a, like a 1% chance that there's, I didn't tell you, I'm sorry. There's like a 1% chance that there's some cyanide in the, in, in, in the food that we put out there, okay? But it's only a 1% chance, right? There's a lot less than 100 people here, right? So chances are that we're, we're all good, right? Certainly when it comes to anything physical in that sense, uh, we would have a very different approach. Ramban in Devarim, okay? That actually is this week's Parsha, by the way. That's why uh, I decided to focus this week on on Kashrut. The Tom, the reason it states for your holy nation to the Lord your God in connection do not eat a kid in its mother's milk, right, is not because this is a disgusting food. Rather, it is forbidden in order that we should be holy regarding our food and not act as a cruel and merciless nation, milking the mother in order to cook her kid in her milk. All meat and milk is included in this prohibition, even when, when one does not cook milk, meat in its mother's milk, right? No, never, nonetheless, since any nursing mother is called a mother and any nursling is called a kid, cooking them together is always considered to be cruel. So that's interesting, because that actually is a chok. What, what is a chok? What type of mitzvah is, is categorized as a chok? That we don't know the reason behind it. Okay, and milk and meat, right? There are reasons that can be given. Ramban gives a reason. Um, Rav Hirsch gives a gives a very very interesting explanation. Right? He says that. Well, he, he breaks it down like this. What is a plant? What does a plant want in life? What are the aspirations of a plant? Two things. What is it? Hmm. Nut that's one category of nutrition and reproduction, right? Reproduction, right? The fruit is encapsulating the seed in something tasty so it'll be eaten by animals and then excreted and then spread, right? So a plant's life is all about nutrition and reproduction. What is an animal's life all about? The same. Nutrition and reproduction. But it's a mobile nutrition and reproduction, right? It has the ability to move. What gives it the ability to move? 
muscle. Muscle is every time that we are moving, any movement at all, what is that? That is basar, that is meat. Muscles is what allows us to move. Every movement that we make, my eyes just turned, it's muscular movement, right? It's all muscle. So basically, he says, an animal is a mobile plant. In terms of aspirations in life, an animal is a mobile plant. Nutrition, reproduction. Now, milk is fascinating because milk is the nutrition that is consumed after reproduction. Right? So milk is a combination, Rabbi Hirsch says, of this idea of nutrition and reproduction. Muscle is the ability to, oh, now I can move in order to nutrition and reproduction. So he says, the Torah says, separate those two. We don't want to become like an animal is a mobile plant. We don't want to become a mobile plant greater, higher thinking plant. We want to make sure that we are not just all about nutrition and reproduction, because then we're just like the cow in Oma, but are much smarter than that. So different reasons are given for that. Let's go to part two, starting out kosher, right? What are the, what are the, the, the requirements for an animal to be a kosher animal, split hooves, and choose its cud. Zota chaya, number one in part two, vayikra, this is the animal you can eat. Kol ve'ma she'er al-aretz, kol ve'ma parasa, shersad shesa parasot, malat ge'ra ve'ma ota tochelu. It has to chew its cud and have split hooves. Okay? I'm going to go through this quickly. I don't want to spend time, too much time on this. I want, I want to focus on the third part also. Okay? Now, the Torah lists the non-kosher birds. Fair enough. Right? And actually, interestingly enough, in this week's Parsha again, we have the requirement of kosher slaughter. And this verse actually is used as one of the sources that shows us clearly that there was a Torah Shabal Peh. What's a Torah Shabal Peh? Oral Torah given to us on Sinai along with the teachings of the written Torah. Where do we see that? Take a look in this Pasuk in Devarim. Vizavachta, number three, part two, number three. Vizavachta, you will slaughter from your herd and your cattle that God has given you. Ka'asher tziviticha, as I have commanded you. And then v'achalta v'sharech, be able to eat that meat to your soul's desire. You will slaughter it as I have commanded you. The only problem is, if you look in the entire Torah, there's no instruction as to how to slaughter. So what does that mean? You shall slaughter as I have commanded you. If all we have is the written Torah, then somewhere in the written Torah, there would need to be this command as to how we are meant to slaughter but we don't find that anywhere. So this is one of the many indications that we see within the Torah itself that there has to have been a concurrent explanation. To me, the, the clearest one is the Torah tells us, as we say in the Shema, that it should be, the Tefillin should be a sign on your hand and, an, and a totafot between your eyes. What's a totafot? What's a totafot? I don't know. Let's see where else in the Torah we have totafot. We'll get it from that context. Nowhere else in the Torah. Right? And if you go to a part of India, the Jews there are wearing round purple tefillin. Did you know that? Good, because it's not true. Any Jew anywhere in the world wearing tefillin is wearing exactly what? A black? Square black. Square 
black box. One box, four boxes there with exactly the same thing in them. So how could it be that the Torah writes this thing that is, forget about uh, that it's unclear, it, it's impenetrable. And yet every Jew who's, uh, who's performing this mitzvah is doing it in the same exact manner. So if you're Moses on Mount Sinai and God says, and you shall wrap a sign on your arm and totes up between your eyes, what are you going to say? What? Tell me more. What's that? There needs to be an explanation that comes along with it. And that is our Torah, Sheb Baal Peh. Okay, in Vayikra, number four, we're commanded not to eat if it has not been, an animal has not been properly slaughtered. And um, the Sayat number five, we also have to remove certain parts, the Gid Hanasheh, the Sayatic nerve, that, that is based on the, the event of Jacob struggling with the angel back there in Bereshit, in Genesis, right? And also the, fat, the blood has to be removed, the fat has to be removed, right? And there are ways that this needs to be done. And that's why in America, where there's such an abundance of meat, we just don't eat the hind quarters. That just goes off to the non-kosher market because that is super labor intensive and knowledge, halakhic knowledge, right, intensive in order to be able to. Okay, fish has fins and scales. Insects must not be eaten, except for what insects can be eaten? Yes, yes, a certain type of grasshopper, right? And the Yemenites, Yemenite Jews have the tradition as to which grasshoppers can be eaten, right? We, thankfully, don't have that tradition, right? And therefore, right, to us, uh, we don't. Okay. A very, very interesting explanation or idea was is presented about the chewing its cud and split hoofs. Okay, the animal that has, the only animal that has split hooves and doesn't chew its cud is the pig. And an animal that chews its cud but doesn't have split hooves is the camel. Now, if we look at those two animals and the that they align with, we see something very, very interesting. The Western world are pig eaters. Right? I think pork is probably the most common meat here in the United States. Western world, Natalie and I were in were in Madrid a number of years ago on our way when we had the Beth Jacob Poland Israel trip. We stopped off in Madrid on the way. Everything is pig over. Right? And some, I, I, I heard someone's, I, I, I've heard it said that the Jews who were the Moranos in Spain needed to show that they were not Jews. So that's why they would always hang up like right? pig. But that became very, very common there. Right? Now, split hooves. Hooves represent motion going forward. The Western world is all about progress moving forward right this is only the iphone i don't know what it is it's only the eight or the ten it's an embarrassment let me let me put this away right out with the old in with the new everything is about moving forward moving forward moving forward right our society doesn't respect everyone wants to look younger everyone wants to look young why? Because that's that's what that's that's what we want to be, right? We don't respect the experience that one has gained from old age, right? Western society is all about moving forward, moving forward, moving forward. The camel. When you think of a camel, what society do you think of? The Arabs, the Middle Eastern society. The Middle Eastern society now chewing its cud. What is that? 
That is a regurgit. What, what, what does it mean to chew its cud? Right? Animals have four different stomachs. They swallow, then they regurgitate, they re-swallow, they re-chew it, and then swallow again, and then it goes, right? And that's how they they break down, right? They're eating grass, only these things which need a lot more breakdown than, than other foods. So it is a regurgitation of the past. That's what it is. And isn't it fascinating that that whole Middle Eastern society is so much rooted in the past, right? We have to avenge the battle of 1347. I, 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 it's, it's, it's these old, old, and even their wealth, they're trying to, to transition now, but their wealth is based on oil. What is oil? Fossil fuel. That's what oil is. We have to eat animals that both chew their cud and have split hooves. Judaism is not forgetting the past. On the contrary, there's tremendous reverence for the past. But it's not locked into the past either. It is built on the past, and then it is applied as we move forward. There's a reverence for the past, the respect for the past. We're building on the past, right? We discussed in earlier in some of the parsha classes, the very first service that was done in the temple every day was the Trumat HaDeshen, the collection of the ashes from the previous day's service. That's not just janitorial work. That's the start of our avoda. That's the start of our divine service daily in the temple. There is this recognition that we are building on an illustrious past, but we're building on that and we're moving forward. And that, some say, is represented by this idea of the past and the future, the animals that chew their cud, and that have the split hooves. And yeah, that is one of the many lessons that we have here. Okay, let's go to keeping it kosher. Part number three. Now, right, of all the Kashwood questions that I'm asked, right, right, it's never, uh, Rabbi, a pig wandered into my kitchen and I think it might have gotten into something. Right, right. All of our kosher questions revolve. Almost all our kosher questions revolve around milk and meat, because those are two um, strong entities that we have going on in our kitchen, sometimes concurrently. Right, and that is where there is the the spillage, the 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 that Venn diagram where the two meet. That's where we run into our issues. So let's take a look. In Shmot and in Devarim, again, this week's parasha. Lo tebashel gedi v'chalev ima. Right? Do not cook a goat in its mother's milk. Right? That is, as we as he quoted before, that is the prohibition, the Torah prohibition, that uveshlosha mekomot, number two, nichtav b'Torah. It repeats this three times in the Torah. Echad, one is to teach me le'iser achila that you can't eat. Biblically, Torah level prohibition, you can't eat milk and meat that were cooked together. In other words, having a uh, washing down a hamburger with a I used to think that hamburger was because of ham, but it's not, <laughs> right? It's because, huh? Not a bit. It, it originated in Hamburg. Right. We have the Hamburgs here. That's why I mentioned this over here. Yeah. Right. I remember my father used to call it a beef burger. He said, we shouldn't call it a hamburger, that we don't eat ham. That I later found out that actually <laughs> nothing to do with ham, but it has to do with Hamburg. Okay. So the Torah prohibition is eating milk and meat that were cooked together. Okay. Washing down a uh, a hamburger with a with a uh, milkshake, right? Rabbinically is not allowed. 
but the Torah prohibition is when they are cooked together. And rabbinically, we also separate, right? And after eating meat, we wait the six hours. Two reasons we give for that, why we wait the six hours after eating meat. So two reasons given is either because there's a certain amount of shuman, of grease, of oil that remains in the throat, or basar ben shinayim, right? If you don't floss afterwards, right, there'll be meat stuck in your teeth for six hours afterwards. So what does six hours do? Right, so by that time, it, I believe, uh, well, well, at least one way of looking at it is that the, the digestive enzymes that are in our saliva will work on it to the point that it's no longer considered to be um, potent. So one is you can't eat the mixture. You're not allowed to derive any benefit from such a mixture and forbidden to cook such a mixture. Right? That's why we have started um, kosher culinary schools because even if one's not going to eat it, one is not allowed to cook the milk, and the meat together. Okay, let's see number three, Rav Yaakov Luban from OU Kosher Laboratories. The rabbis extended the prohibition to disallow the eating of meat and dairy products at the same meal or preparing them on the same utensils. Furthermore, milk products cannot be consumed after eating meat for a period of time. There are different traditions for how long to wait between meat and dairy. The most prevalent custom is to wait six hours. The German Jews, I think it's three. Yeah. Three. yeah. And the, Amsterdam Jews only 45. Say it again? 45 minutes. For who? Amsterdam Jews. I think that's an hour, but yeah, Amsterdam and Dutch, right? It is an hour. Yeah. Yeah. But for well, uh, for, for most of us, I would say uh, the prevalent custom, as he writes, is six hours. Meat may be eaten following dairy products, with one exception, hard cheese aged six months or more, which would require the same waiting time as that of dairy after meat. Rabbi Eidelitz, right, we mentioned before the two apps that one can use to, um, to find a listing of the kosher agencies. One of them is Kosher Quest by Rabbi Eidelitz. Foods cooked by a non-Jew are forbidden since it is possible that they would serve non-kosher foods, and there's also precaution against assimilation. Wine prepared by an Akam is forbidden as a precaution against assimilation. And that's very interesting, right? In other words, there's a certain intimacy toward when drinking wine together, a certain intimacy when a meal was prepared, was cooked, right? And we want to have respectful friendships, but we're also concerned against the assimilation. So we have certain safeguards. There, there, there's a fellow, he's the nicest guy, his name is Camille. He works in Wholesome Choice, and he does all of those French pastries, uh, all, all the stuff there. He and I become friends uh, over the years of my shopping at Wholesome Choice. And, and, and he said to me, he said, let, let me make you something. Let me make you something, right? And I, I explained to him, I, 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 I said, I, I keep the laws. I said, you have halal, he's a Muslim. You have halal, I have kashrut, you know. I, I, well, you tell me what I could put into it and I'll make it, right? And I explained it's more complicated, but I appreciate it. But I realized then, right, this idea, right, there's a certain intimacy. There's, you know, we break bread together. There's a certain bond that's created and like i said we, we we want to we don't want that we don't want we, we need to have the, have the boundaries in terms of of that closeness please why do you do dairy after meat but not oh you could do meat after dairy but not dairy after Right. So the two reasons that we have for meat is either that, gre that, that, that grease that remains or, well, keep in mind that based on to strict Torah law, they can't be cooked together. Right. And if they were cooked together, they can't be eaten. So these are rabbinic extensions that were made, safeguards. The way I like to put it is, is you know, if, uh, if, if, um, 
the electric company would come and cut out a big chunk of the street in front of my house because they have to get to the pipes to the wires. If they would not put a protective tape, whatever, around it, that would be criminal on their part. So the rabbi saw this as danger, as we sort of saw today, and therefore they have these safeguards around. So meat in particular, you have that it gets stuck, right? And that in the teeth, between the teeth, and that it has that that um, shuman, that grease, right? Which is not the case. You have a nice cheese omelet, right? You're good to go afterwards. It's not it's not sitting around. So those are the two reasons why 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 the rabbis instituted the waiting after the meat. And so hard cheese also is considered to. Yes. So I, I I'm not sure. I, I, I don't know if there are any any connoisseurs of of fine cheeses. I'm an American cheese kind of guy, right? <laughs> but, um, right, I think they do have, uh, there's a certain mold. I mean, I, I think there's a lot more that goes on with those cheeses, those six month cheeses. So that's why it was uh, extended to that also. Yeah, one more question. Please. But why are you not supposed to have fish and meat on the same side? Okay, okay. <laughs> so fish and, and I know meat. That's not related to top food, Correct. Right? Correct. So actually, the Gemara, the Gemara says that that is not an issue of kashrut. That is an issue of of sakana, of health, of health. Right. To the best of our knowledge, I don't think uh, if you look in any medical journals, I don't think you'll find any any issues of of milk of sorry of meat and fish together. But what I like to say is I was born BC. I don't look that old. I was born BC. That's before cholesterol. Okay. And right then as many eggs as you want. Right. And then we say, no, 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 not so many eggs, cholesterol. Now, right now cholesterol is the number one killer. Yeah. But eggs actually are healthy. We now say you can't. Right. So the medical field is always, always evolving. So, um, so the fact that that modern day medicine does not see any harm in meat and fish, that doesn't that doesn't shake me so much. So yeah, so those can, right right pots and pans could be all the same at the same meal, just not on this not an actual mixing of the two. That's what that is. And the Gemara actually says chamira sakanta meisura. We're even stricter when it comes to something that could be that's dangerous than something that is prohibited, and that's why, uh, yeah, yes. She was asking about this. Sorry, we're not talking about that. She asked about the fish and meat. Why are we using another utensil? So as to not have any mixing at all. You can rinse off. Well, using different tens does not mean you have to have a different set. Right. You don't have to have you know your dairy silver, your meat silver, and your fish silver. Right, but in order to avoid any mixing, so it won't be on the same plate, you won't use the same fork or knife unless it's been rinsed off. And when is the problem when you have to wait six hours for milk or cheese or anything? Correct. Like but what about the time if you drink milk and then if you? So there you don't right. As Becca said, there, there you don't need to wait. Okay. Just Typically, we'll wait twenty minutes or so that you yeah. you know that you don't have any of that M and M still chuck stuck over there <laughs> before you. Uh, those, those are hard to clean out. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes, Janet. So if you have some bread and some milk, so first you... Um, some bread and some milk. So you made milk, so now you have a meal. Good. In, but now you would have to bench before you would have the meat immediately 20 minutes, right? Or in... If it's not a Yom Tov or Shabbat, you, can you still have it right away after? Um, I don't think you would have to. I don't. I don't think. I don't think you have to. You have to bench necessarily between the two. You can't have the same bread, the same loaf that you had with your meat, right? Now, if it's sliced bread, you're taking it out. But if you got a bread there and you're, you know, dipping, right? So then you wouldn't have the same the same loaf over there for the other one. But um, I don't think you have to bench in the middle. Okay, so yeah. the Shabbos you would. Um, I don't know if you have to on Shabbos either. So you could start with the 
Milchik first course. Clear everything away and make motzi. Clear everything away. Sing some erot. Sing some Shabbos songs for 20 minutes. Right? Clear everything away. Right? And not not bench and not rebench for. Right. And then. I mean, you're making things difficult for yourself, but but you could do that. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. If you like a soft cheese, like a fresh mozzarella, and you oh, have fresh yeah. hey, everyone does as <laughs> everyone does as they do. Yeah. Okay. Let's see the last part. Rav Tzadik Hakohen from the pre Tzadik. And Rav Tzadik always goes into the, the the deeper, the more kabbalistic aspects. Care in kosher food is considered as if one has fulfilled all the mitzvot of the Torah. The observance of the laws of Kashrut encompasses. Oh, I haven't been moving this down. I'm so sorry. One second. The observance of the laws of Kashrut encompasses all the other laws of the Torah. In the Garden of Eden, the snake was only able to entice them, Adam and Chava, Adam and Eve, to sin by creating a desire for the forbidden food, the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Someone who is careful about only eating kosher foods and imbuing them with holiness thereby keeps all the mitzvot of the Torah. Because the only way that the evil inclination can rule over a person is through eating and drinking. As the verse, st- as the verse states, right, you shall eat and drink, be careful, lest your heart lead you astray. In the Zohar, it states, the tree that Adam Arishon, Adam Arishon ate from was wheat. Others say it was grapes. Others say it was a fig. What's another opinion? What? Huh? Apple. No. Apple is not on the list. <laughs> Etrog. Yes. Right? Apple is not on the list. Apple comes from, I believe, a painting of Michelangelo. That's where that comes from. Apple is not one of the one of the actual choices. Okay. These opinions do not disagree with one another, but are all true, the Zohar says. How can they all be true? Was it wheat? Was it grapes? Was it fig? Right? Now, there's a famous story of the rabbi. He's hearing a dispute, right? Here's one side. Oh, you're right. Here's another side. Oh, you're right. Someone says to them, Rabbi, how can they both be right? You're right. You're right. Right? So how do we have wheat, grapes, fig, and they're all right? The truth is that when the Torah states the tree of life was in the middle of of the garden, this means that the inner spirituality of each tree in the garden was the same as that of the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. If Adam had eaten first from the tree of life, In every other food that he ate, he would have tasted the taste of Torah, which is life. When he ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, he made every other food contain within it the taste of that tree. And this is the source of all sins. So each one contained that of all of the trees. When a person corrects this sin through eating in holiness, he thereby keeps all of the mitzvot and is saved from the challenges of the evil inclination. Interesting. This idea of the tim tamale that we discussed before, the, 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 the blockage as opposed to the, the free flow that one can have all relates back to that eating from the eights hadat. So it's not just like I said before, the idea that it all started with eating. And now we have our opportunity to correct that. But on a much deeper level, all of the food stuff that we have was all rooted in that tree. And we either direct it in a positive manner or in a non-positive manner. Right? And that is, and like I said before, I know for me personally, just the idea of Kashrut is that we have this awareness it's it, it almost gives a constant constant awareness right you know if Natalie and i are traveling somewhere we go off somewhere 
off the beaten track. So we we uh we manage our 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 kashrut, save a lot of money on restaurants, that's for sure, and uh, and manage our uh, our and that is this this constant awareness that it gives us. So it's a constant awareness and it's a constant um, part of who we are. Okay, my friends, we'll call it over here. Any other questions? Yes. So going back to the foods cooked by a non-Jew, is that truly cooked? Or could a goy make you a salad? Okay, okay, it's interesting. So that is actually food. There are, there are a number of limitations on that. So it's food that's cooked that would not that would not that would not be eaten raw, and also it is food that the term that we use in halacha that's ola al shuchan malachim. It will go onto the table of a king or queen, right? And it's that same meaning. It's it's considered to be a a uh, important food, a, a a a respected, dignified food. Because we're going back to that intimacy that my friend Camille wanted to, uh, you know, by right, it's got to be something of of significance, right? So that's when it applies. But a salad would not be an issue. It's, it's got to be cooked, something that that would not be eaten raw, and something of dignified importance. So if you go to a kosher restaurant, the the people who are cooking in the back. Are okay. All, they're all Jewish. Okay. No, they're not Jewish. So why is it a kosher restaurant? So as long as a Jew was involved in the process, even just turning on, turning on the, the flame, as long as a Jew was somewhat involved in the process, it's not an issue. Okay, so in a kosher restaurant, they're going to have a rule that it's the mashkiach, right? The person who supervises the kosher, he's got to turn on, turn on the, turn on the ovens and turn on, turn on the fires, right? And and in a, in the less modern world of not modern Judaism, less modern world of of technology, when we had a, a pilot, right? So then, so in many industrial kitchens where there's a pilot, so as long as Mashiach right turns on that pilot, then we're good to go until the pilot goes out, because everything is coming from that from that. So as long as as long as a Jewish person is Involved, even uh, the example that Mark gives, of, he th- he tossed a little match into the fire, right? A little flint into the fire, right? So how much, right? But contributed, then it, then that's not an issue. Okay, good. Okay, good. It, it seems so problematic, right? Having worked in a restaurant, people who work in restaurants together are family. If this is a prohibition against assimilation, allowing a non-Jew to work in a restaurant. Is, is the essence of assimilating two cultures that you're trying to keep apart. Interesting. Um, l- 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 let me approach that on two fronts, right? We don't go looking to add on more and more and more, right? We do take the spirit and, and try to apply it, meaning, right? Um, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to say, and therefore, since we had this idea that we shouldn't uh, be eating the food, so therefore we can't have any non-Jewish workers or cooks in the restaurant. We can't go into business at all, right? But we would take this idea, this concept, and say, let's let's do our best to apply it, right? So even though, right, you know, um, going out for a drink with all my coworkers. Uh, here in Shul is not a problem, right? But depending where I'm working, right? So that might be something that I would try to avoid with the spirit. I, I don't know if working together in restaurants, I know we're, I'm not such a big restaurant goer, but I, I, I worked in a hotel last summer and uh, the summer I met Natalie. That was the one saving right. grace, right? But um, um, that, that kitchen was hell. That kitchen was was not... Uh, oh, let me bond with the, with the, that kitchen. Right, one of the class, my classmates, my late brother Josh. He was a, right. So we said, well, we had to wear our white shirts with our black bow ties, right? So we'd all have it unbuttoned, the bow tie sitting over there, and the owner always get angry. So when he 
Josh, Josh, right? Why isn't your shirt buttoned? And he says, Teddy, it's hot as hell. So he says, how do you know how it is in hell? And Josh answered classic words. I've worked here for five summers. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, I don't view restaurant kitchens and, um, and um, hotel kitchens as a place of, of intimate bonding. It's a, uh, right? So I don't know if I agree with you, in, in, you know, if that, that a restaurant is that. But if it is, then I'll say what I said before. We don't look to keep adding, right? Therefore, you can't do this, this, or that but we do want to take the spirit of it. And if it is such a situation, then one would try to keep it more to, uh, more to business and not to, uh, and not to that which will lead to assimilation. Yeah. It just seems, it seems strange that we talk on, you know, page three about putting up safeguards so as not to even come close Right, but then so so the difference is the rabbis, the, the sages of the Talmud, and the safeguards that they put up, and me and you 